This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. Immigration, refugees, religious tests. Cornell professor Maria Cristina Garcia examines the history of an America that has not always been a welcoming place for those seeking freedom. Harvard professor Danielle Allen sees a future of fragmented presidential politics based on smaller constituencies whipped up by outsiders with limited appeal. Is the answer multiple parties? And Bill Press talks with freshman Democratic Congressman Ruben Gallego. Are you tired of Tea Party Republicans and Rush Limbaugh dominating the airwaves? Do you want the facts you won't get on Fox or even on CNN? Then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. Immigration expert Maria Cristina Garcia says that for anyone trying to enter the country to engage in terrorism, the refugee program is the hardest way. And we say hello to Maria Cristina Garcia, the Howard Newman Professor of American Studies at Cornell University. She studies about refugees, immigrants, exiles, and transnationals in the Americas. Professor Garcia, thank you very much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Thank you for inviting me. You're quite welcome, and it's nice to have you with us. You have studied the history of political refugees, and despite the ideal of America as a a welcoming place, that hasn't always been the case, has it? Well, you're right. Uh, the, The United States has given refuge to close to 4 million refugees since 1948. So, so you can say that our policy has been very generous. But while the White House has, um, has taken the lead on refugee policy, they've had to convince a reluctant American population that admitting refugees was in the national interest, that it was the right thing to do. Um, public opinion polls show that Americans were generally sympathetic to the plight of refugees, but they were not convinced that refugees needed to be resettled here. I'll give you just two examples. During the Hungarian refugee crisis of 1956, many Americans were suspicious of Eisenhower's plans to resettle Hungarian refugees in the U.S. They feared that communist spies and saboteurs would enter the U.S. and cause us harm. And the draconian immigration laws of 1924 were also still in place, and, and, and those laws, that law barred or severely limited the migration from certain parts of the world, including Eastern Europe. So um, members of the Eisenhower administration had, had, uh, had their work cut out for them. They had to work with public relations firms on, on Madison Avenue to, to try to sell the idea of, of the Hungarian refugee program to a reluctant American population. And they worked with key journalists to place new stories in the popular press portraying Hungarians as democracy-loving, as freedom-loving people. In other words, people very much like Americans who we needed to support. And then 20 years later, Americans were again conflicted about admitting refugees. This time it was from Southeast Asia. Um, Despite the news of the squalid refugee camps in Thailand and news that hundreds of Vietnamese boat people were dying at sea trying to reach safety somewhere in the world, only a third of Americans were in favor of accommodating more Southeast Asians on U.S. soil. This time it was the fear that uh, Vietnamese and Cambodians and Laotians were simply too culturally different to be um, assimilated into U.S. society. But Americans also wanted to forget the Vietnam War. Um, and these refugees, I guess you could say, were a constant reminder of that traumatic period in American history. But there, you know, there are many other uh, historical examples that we could point to. Uh, as I said earlier, the White House has generally taken the lead on refugee policy over the past 60 years, while the public has, has always been much more resistant because, practically speaking, it is their local communities that must accommodate refugees on a day-to-day basis. You know, a, a lot of people don't differentiate between refugee status, asylum, or regular immigration. Isn't becoming a refugee the most difficult process of them all? You're absolutely right. Um, These are all separate tracks in the immigration bureaucracy, and each one has its own bureaucratic set of hurdles. Refugees cross international borders, they settle in neighboring countries, and there they come under the attention of international organizations like the UNHCR, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, who then might refer the most desperate cases for resettlement in a third country like the United States. But referral does not mean automatic admission. 
once the U.S. receives a referral, the State Department and the Department of Homeland Security begin the lengthy process of screening referrals for possible admission. And since 9-11, the vetting process for refugee status is particularly intense because, you know, understandably, we don't want to sponsor a potential terrorist. Um, the State Department now reports that refugees can expect to be screened over an 18 to 24 month period, but it often takes much longer than that, and we only admit a certain number of refugees per year. If you look at the data from 1980 to 2013, you'll notice that the annual quota is rarely filled, and the vetting is in intense, and, and many things can flag a potential applicant and derail his or her chances of selection. Even Iraqi and Afghan translators and other service personnel who've already been vetted just to be able to work with U.S. military forces overseas, even they are, are not guaranteed admission to the U.S. Now, asylum seekers, uh, they enter on a totally different track in the immigration bureaucracy. They peti uh, petition for protection while on U.S. soil. They might come in on a tourist visa or a student visa, for example, and ask for asylum once they are on U.S. soil. And, and here, the Justice Department plays a more prominent role in asylum matters. Um, but asylum cases are evaluated by specially trained asylum officers and or immigration judges. And these applicants are also screened and vetted for security reasons. Now, why did Cubans, other Latin Americans, Vietnamese get preferred treatment? Is this because they were fleeing left-wing governments? Well, during the Cold War, priority was given to those who were fleeing communist countries, and, and the term refugee became synonymous with someone who fled communism, at least in this country. Um, one could argue that refugee policy became a, a very useful tool of Cold War foreign policy. You know, in the Cold War, we were struggling for the hearts and minds of the non-aligned nations, and refugees became important symbols. They demonstrated the desirability of democracy over totalitarianism, the desirability of capitalism over communism. Refugees went to great lengths to escape a communist country. They built underground tunnels. They climbed over the Berlin Wall. They even built hot air balloons to fly over borders. So they, they demonstrated the innate desire to live in a free society. And during the Cold War, the executive branch used a, a, a little-known codicil in the McCarran-Walter Act, the parole authority, um, to guarantee, to allow, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of people uh, to come into the United States outside of immigration quota. And it was this use of the parole authority that um, became contested, and Congress grew increasingly tired of the overuse of the parole authority, and, and that's one of the reasons why they passed the 1980 Refugee Act to impose limits on the number of refugees who could be brought into the U.S. each year. Um, the U.S. Refugee Act also tried to free the, uh, the term refugee from its association with anti-communism. It adopted the U.N. definition of the term, uh, and so a refugee now has to demonstrate a well-founded fear of persecution based on race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group, or political opinion. But even after passage of the Refugee Act, those who fled communist governments continued to be prioritized for admission to the U.S. And um, during the Cold War, most of our refugees came from just three countries, the Soviet Union, Cuba, and Vietnam. Mm. We're speaking with Maria Cristina Garcia, Howard Newman Professor of American Studies at Cornell University. Uh, professor, in your opinion, to what extent would admitting 10,000 Syrian refugees to America present a threat of terrorism? Well, no system is 100 percent secure, but we can't guarantee that a visitor on a tourist visa won't perform an act of terrorism either. Uh, if somebody wanted to cause the nation harm, the refugee track would not be the optimum way to enter the United States given the intense vetting of refugees, the long waiting period, and the low probability of admission. You'd try to enter the U.S. through some other way, but as I said, no system is completely fail-proof. When when we're just sort of as an as, as, aside here, when when we're constantly referring to the folks, when I'm thinking about it, what's going on in Europe right now, and we refer to all of these folks as refugees, but but they aren't necessarily refugees by our definition because they haven't gone through this type of vetting process. Is that right? I mean, is, should we be referring to these folks in some other way? Well, um, well, that's tricky. I mean, language is tricky. Um, uh, we tend to use the word refugee um, popularly in, in many different contexts to um, to refer to a wide range of migration experiences. 
But according to international law, people have the right to make a claim for asylum, to have to to try to make a successful claim for asylum, to prove that they are worthy of refugee status, of asylum status. And you know what we're seeing in the media right now. Is we refer to some groups as as refugees, uh, say the Syrians, uh, and we might refer to others as as migrants, uh, suggesting that they are that they are moving across borders for economic reasons, and that's a value judgment in itself as well. Um, but according to international law, we should give people if people feel that they have um, that they are in need of refuge. Um, they should have the right to make a claim for asylum in a particular society. Okay. Now, to be clear on the law, immigration and refugee status, totally a federal government responsibility, correct? That's true. So if that's the case, what are all the Republican governors talking about when they say, no Syrians in my state? I, they don't have a leg to stand on there, do they? Well, not really, but the Office of Refugee Resettlement in the Department of, of Health and Human Services, they work with local agencies across the country to integrate refugees in communities across the country. And they're not going to place refugees in communities where they will experience violence. I mean, these are victims of trauma. They don't need to be victimized further. And whether we like it or not, the governor of a state sets the tone for reception. When Americans hear their governors use vitriolic language, some may feel that it gives them permission to act with hostility. And so those who work with refugees know this, and so they'll try to place uh, refugees in communities where they are welcome to to try to facilitate their integration. And in your mind, is there a difference between the denial of Jewish refugees from Hitler and the call for banning Muslim refugees? Well, they are not in uh, completely identical situations, but there are parallels to be sure. During the 1930s and 1940s, uh, we could have easily accommodated more Jewish refugees, even without expanding our immigration quotas. Our immigration quotas went unfilled for most of the war, but we chose not to accept a lar large numbers of refugees because of fears that German spies and saboteurs would infiltrate the U.S. Through, through the refugee policy, or at least that was the official discourse. But anti-Semitism was more likely the, the real explanation. And you can get a sense of the anti-Semitism in American society just by reading um, the congressional hearings uh, on, say, the Rogers Wagner bill, um, for example. Um, today, today we have the opportunity to assist up to 10,000 Syrians, some of whom are Muslim, Others are Christian. And when you think about it, it's a small number when you consider that there are over 60 million refugees and displaced persons worldwide at this particular moment in history. So the 10,000 are a drop in the proverbial bucket. But the policy will make a huge difference to those privileged 10,000. It'll make a huge difference in their lives. Okay. But I predict that the refugee quota won't be filled. When you look at the refugee quotas since the 1980s, we have always come short of meeting the quotas. Mm, okay. Maria Cristina Garcia, Howard Newman Professor of American Studies at Cornell University, joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Professor, thank you so much for your time. We do look forward to having you back with, it, back with us again soon. Thank you so much for the invitation. You are quite welcome. And this is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to Democrats for America's future and help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on donate at the top of the page. This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. Professor Danielle Allen foresees a future of fragmented politics in America, with the rise of outsiders leading small, fervent constituencies. We'll talk to her about that in just a moment. Right now, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his Common Sense Commentary. Don Blankenship did not get what he deserves in his federal trial, but he definitely deserves what he got. 
guilty, declared all 12 West Virginia jurors who pondered the charge that this arrogant and avaricious CEO of Massey Energy, Inc. willfully conspired to violate America's mine safety laws. As a result of that conspiracy, 29 miners were essentially murdered by the corporation on April 5, 2010, in a horrific explosion deep inside Massey's Upper Big Branch coal mine. Blankenship, a multimillionaire right-wing ideologue, union buster, and political heavyweight, ran the UBB mine like a lawless third-world operator. It was one of the most dangerous workplaces in the country because this kingpin of King Cole relentlessly put profit over people, recklessly endangering miners. But Cole is, indeed, king in West Virginia, so the laws are written to coddle the royals of the industry. Thus, Blankenship's guilt is to be punished by a maximum of one year in prison, and his diamond-studded legal team intends to have the jury's unanimous verdict of guilt toss down the dark shaft of judicial favoritism for the rich. What the mining baron deserved was to be put in stocks on the state's capital grounds where he would be subjected to a steady stream of derision from the families of mine workers who were degraded, made ill, and even killed to haul up coal so Don could live in luxury. He escaped that justice, but he'll never shake off the guilty judgment of the jurors or of the American people who followed the month-long, widely-covered trial that fully documented the rank immorality of this man and his ill-gotten fortune. This is Jim Hightower saying he undoubtedly thinks he got away with murder, but in the court of public opinion, his legacy is that he has turned the name Blankenship into a four-letter word. Need an antidote to the progressive blues? Want some good news about how grassroots folks are rebelling against the corporate powers and winning? Well, here's an easy-to-swallow pill for you, the Hightower Lowdown. Hightower's monthly newsletter will give you the lowdown, even as it lifts you up. It's four pages a month, jam-packed with facts you can use, actions you can take, and Jim's own Texas humor, all for only $15 a year. To become a lowdowner, go to HightowerLowdown.org. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. Danielle Allen, a government professor and MacArthur genius, thinks we should be moving in the direction of multiple political parties. And we say hello to Danielle Allen, director of Harvard's Edmund Safra Center for Ethics and a professor of government and education. She is a political theorist who has published broadly in democratic theory, political sociology, and the history of political thought. Danielle Allen, thank you so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Good morning. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, we appreciate your time with us. As a political theorist, can you tell us whether the emergence of outsider candidates like Bernie Sanders, Donald Trump, Ben Carson, is that a new trend in American history? And and if it is, what does that mean? I think it is a new trend, and I actually think it's a result of changes to our communications landscape that come from digital technology. The barrier to entry for groups that want to impact the political process is much lower than it used to be, which means it's possible for people with smaller constituencies to make a difference on politics. And so when you have that, you don't need this, uh, the same degree of consolidation of a party or an organization that has a sort of moderating or centering effect. Mm-hmm. So I think mm-hmm. we should expect to see a more fragmented electorate, uh, smaller constituencies being led by outsider candidates on a regular basis. Now, how can people support candidates whose, quite frankly, their view of reality is so distorted? Have have we come to a point where knowledge doesn't matter? So it's a super interesting question, and I think it's one we should all be puzzling over. The way I've come to see this is that for any given candidate, there's something that they've hit on that does connect to something real, and people seize on that and are prepared to simply disregard the rest of it. So to take Trump, for example, I think that the power of his attraction is very simple, and it has to do with his language of being a winner. And I think he has thereby articulated um, a view that some portions of the electorate have that either they themselves individually or the country as a whole is not victorious in the same way that it used to be. So I think then you know, so people recognize in him somebody who's diagnosed something that they also see, and then they just ignore everything else he has to say. 
You know, one of the concerns I have with it, since you brought Trump up as the example, it's I've heard many people say, well, finally, there's somebody who's saying the things we want to hear. But I hear a lot of xenophobic comments. I hear racist comments. I hear, I mean, just horrible things that the guy says. How, how Absolutely. Do, I mean, I don't I don't understand how anybody can think that that's stuff we want to hear. Or do we have a bigger problem with all of these issues in our country than perhaps I believe? Um, well, A, I do think we have a bigger problem with these issues than we've, you know, than many of us have believed lately. Um, so I would agree with that. And yes, I mean, there's no his. It's incredible just the ratio of lies to truth in what he says, as well as the ratio of xenophobia and racism to the other things that he says. Mm-hmm. So I mean, I think it's a combination of. Uh, you know, for me, you know, so the, the, the question that goes to your first question is why do people ignore the lies, right? Because yeah. just, there's so many lies. It's so consistent. We've never had a view of politicians that makes it acceptable for people to be lying at that kind of level. I mean, obviously, there have been lies in politics. We deal with it. But it always has an element of sort of crisis and disappointment when it comes around. And to have somebody who is establishing himself on the basis of lies is fundamentally antithetical to what democratic leadership is about or what democratic leadership needs. So I think it is a huge question sort of why everybody is disregarding that. And I think, um, you know, again, I would just say it's sort of it's the two things. I think there, there is more powerful um, sort of racist and xenophobic um, sort of ideology um, in the country than we have uh, taken seriously in the last 10 to 20 years. Um, and that for some people, again, um, you know, sort of Trump's expression of this sort of one sociological diagnosis about sort of, you know, who's a winner and who's a loser um, strikes a chord. And I think there, too, we have to recognize that there are sort of shifts in the overall pattern of society. Um, you know, U.S. the U.S. is a history is a sort of is a country that, up until the middle of the 20th century, did uh, depend on um, sort of white domination of politics and allocation of resources. And so, to achieve equality, to achieve racial justice, racial fairness requires a redistribution, reallocation. There's just sort of no two ways about it. There will be a sort of different distribution of winners and losers than there was prior to, call it, 1964. And so I think, you know, so Trump is diagnosing that accurately, and the trouble is that um, to defend the egalitarian advances of the last half century, um, we have to push back against that view and diagnosis. So it's also sort of recognizable when one can see its historical causes. Mm-hmm. We're speaking with Danielle Allen, director of Harvard's Edmund Safra Center for Ethics and professor of government and education. There's general agreement that Washington, most specifically Congress, is broken. Theoretically, would democracy and good policy flourish if we had more than two parties? I do think that we should be pushing towards a multi-party landscape. And the question is sort of how to do this is complicated. It involves sort of a lot of state laws that organize parties and that sort of thing. Um, but I think it would be beneficial, partly because, again, to take the specific case of Trump, I'm sorry to sort of come back to that so much, but I actually think it's incredibly important. I mean, we do basically have there, you know, operating something, a political party like the National Front in France or UKIP, in, in Britain, something of that sort, sort of an eth- ethno-nationalist party. And we would be better off if we could name it for what it is, see its actual size and scope, and then be able to respond to it as such. Whereas at present, inside a major party, it has the power to shift the agenda for a far greater portion of the electorate and to pull politicians who ought to be working in more centrist or moderate terms sort of into the orbit of the far right. And so I think actually, given the fragmentation of the electorate, uh, we would be better off with a party structure that let us see the electorate as it's really distributed, um, whereas the current two-party system obscures the actual distribution of opinion without actually providing moderating forces in relationship to the extreme elements. Now, my understanding, you grew up in a conservative African-American family. Does that give you any particular insight into Ben Carson's appeal? I mean, is is he a hypocrite for raising himself up with government assistance and then attacking government support to others? So, I, you know, I don't think my own background gives me any particular insight into Ben Carson. I mean, I, I uh, was raised in the context of the 
Reagan Republican movement in California and the quite intellectual conservatism of that time. And so I think one of the striking things of the current moment is how anti-intellectual um, the conservative party has become. So in that regard, it's no surprise that there's a sort of split among conservatives in terms of assessing the current election. I mean, the sort of the dominant candidates by no means have the sort of degree of intellectual sophistication and engagement that characterized conservatism of the early 80s. Now, you're also an expert on European politics and were an advisor to Britain's Labour Party. Is there a worldwide trend to the right or to the left? And and how does the recent outbreak of terrorism in Europe change things? So I don't think I'm in a position to sort of diagnose worldwide trends. I mean, I think um, there I mean, I think one can point to noticeable patterns. I mean, so. There's a growth, I mean, I think there's an, a, an emptying out of the center. I think that's the sort of more important thing to point to. So, you know, you, you've got Jeremy Corbyn elected as leader of the Labour Party in Britain, so that's a sort of move to the left in that case, but you also have more strength for UKIP and more strength for the National Front in France and so forth. So, I mean, you have uh, sort of, you know, movement to both left and right. And so I think the harder question is to figure out how to rebuild a sort of um, centering center of gravity that uh, prevents the sort of sharpest and starkest um, versions of division and dissension. So to come back to this country again, and and this does relate to terrorism, um, sort of, you know, both international and domestic terrorism, I think, you know, the fact that we see more instances of the use of violence um, take with the Planned Parenthood uh, shooting, um, the fact that we see more instances of that, I, I take to be a reflection of the stark division of the political landscape. And so I do think that actually, um, you know, sort of a, an emphasis on the need for centering and moderating and moderate politics is important, um, not merely as a sort of statement about sort of what policy positions are correct, but also as a statement about what it takes to maintain the fabric of a democratic society over time. One can assume that a democratic society will be characterized by division and dissensus. That's in the nature of the case. Um, the point is that we, the people, have a lot of different views amongst ourselves and that we are taking it on ourselves and taking our own responsibility to achieve collective decisions despite our disagreements, despite our differences. And you know, in contrast to an autocracy or monarchy, which suppresses difference and division and just hands everything down from on high, we insist on working that out for ourselves. So we should always assume that there will be difference and dissensus and division amongst us, but that also means we have an incredible responsibility to find those points of compromise that permit us to hold the social fabric together. That is, to summarize, democracies have necessary centrifugal forces, and therefore we have to be self-conscious about building centripetal forces that keep us glued together. Absolutely. Uh, And before we let you go, what, what can we learn about the financial and political crises in the European community? Oh, gosh. Um, Well, you know, those are really hard issues. And I mean, I think in the first instance, there's just the question of Europe itself and what it means for the nations of Europe to form a federal body. I think that they're struggling with questions very like those that plagued this country in the late 18th century around the Articles of Confederation. And indeed, it was issues around the unsustainability of the Bank of North America in 1786 that really provoked people to push for a constitutional convention. So I think the question is really, uh, will the banking crises and the sort of uh, distribution, really sort of inequitable distribution of power, financial power, as well as political power across the European Union, uh, push them toward a better um, governance structure for the union as a whole, or will the fragmentation um, be decisive? So it's a political question, fundamentally. I think it's very similar to the political question that we faced in 1786, 87, 88. Okay. Danielle Allen, director of Harvard's Edmund Safra Center for Ethics and a professor of government and education, joining us today on americasdemocrats.org. Danielle, thank you so much for your time with us. We look forward to having you back again soon. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. You're Take quite care. welcome. This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for Stand Up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to Democrats for America's Future to keep this show on the air and help elect stand-up Democrats. 
Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. And now Bill Press talks with Arizona Congressman Ruben Gallego. It's the Bill Press Show, Annie Linsky from the Boston Globe, uh, helping us out here this hour, the entire hour, as an FOV, a friend of Bill, and uh, we are very pleased to welcome to the studio a uh, rising star in the Democratic Party, freshman member of Congress, a member of the Progressive Caucus in Congress, uh, from the 7th District of Arizona, Congressman Ruben Gallego. Hey, Congressman, good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you for having Congratulations. me. Congratulations. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, wh- what, what's your uh, impression seeing this big Congress for the first term, first year of your first term? Huh? Well, it's very exciting, but also very scary um, <laughs> in all regards, both personally and, and for the country sometimes. Uh, but, you know, I, to be honest, I've actually met a lot of really great people, both Democrats and Republicans. And I think a lot of the members of Congress here want to do the best for the country. But, uh, you know, at times it, it is frustrating uh, being down there. Do people uh, look at you and say, really, a Democrat from Arizona? Oh, all the time. All yeah. the time, yeah. Right. How did that happen? Well, uh, you know, Arizona actually has some uh, some really nice bright blue areas, um, and we're growing. Uh, you know, it's a growing Latino population. There's a lot of you, uh, young families moving in there. Uh, from all over uh, the country that uh, you know want to see good investments in their communities, I represented an area uh, that uh, is that is that area uh, that is working uh, to basically expand what we, what we think of as the middle class. Um, it's a lot of Latino uh, families mm-hmm. there, uh, and I, I basically started as an activist many years ago, pushing back against some of the kind of hateful uh, rhetoric that you find, especially against Latinos, uh, that was being pushed out by. Uh, mostly the Republican Party at that point, eventually just kind of evolved into into running for office, and then at this at some point I just got on this roller coaster, ended up in Congress four years later. So after serving four years, four years in the, the Arizona State House, House the yes. Arizona State House, right? What's the Latino makeup of your district? It's about uh, 61, 62 percent. Is that right? Yep. Wow. And statewide, it's. So you're not a majority minority state. No, yet, but we're are you? we're pretty like close. California, right? Um, we're about uh, almost forty percent statewide uh, minority. Excuse mm-hmm. me, and we're about thirty uh, percent Latino statewide. Hmm. So wow. and growing. So um, immigration reform. It must be frustrating that this Congress won't even deal with the issue, right? Well, it's very cynical, um, and uh, because. And in all regards, the Republicans know that the best thing they could ever do politically for themselves is to not pass immigration reform because they can basically keep going back to this boogeyman to their base and saying, well, you need to keep bringing us back because if not, immigration reform is going to happen. Then at the same time, they go and speak to a lot of you know, immigration activists and say, well, we could do something, but you know, the Democrats just refuse to work for us or work with us mm-hmm. or – uh, we don't trust the president. This is why we won't do it. And so yeah. it's just this uh, two-step uh, dance that they keep doing. And, and I, you know, I'm hoping at some point, you know, that the dance actually mm-hmm. ends and it runs out. When could that be? I mean, it would have to be after the election, right? Well, that's the problem. We we that were involved in you know, <clears throat> immigration reform and were immigration advocates, uh, you know, have been always hearing the same thing after this election, after mm-hmm. that election, <laughs> yeah. after yeah. this election. Right. Like, well, there's always elections. Heck, yeah. at some point they're going to start saying, well, this is going to affect municipal elections. You have to wait till after municipal elections. I mean, there's always an excuse. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think, uh, you know, the time time is running out. And look, we poll Americans. Americans want immigration reform. They understand carbon immigration reform. They believe that's a good uh, pathway. Uh, the problem is, is that the Republican base, the primary voter, the person that gets that comes out and votes in these Republican congressional primaries, is absolutely against climate immigration yeah. reform, and that's what's stalling everything. Well, and you mentioned uh, it play it works for them in the short term, right? But in the long term, it's the worst thing for the Republican Party. Well, I think in the long term, it Would makes it agree? more difficult. Yeah, it makes it more difficult for them to win national elections. But at the same time, you have a lot of gerrymandered congressional districts. Where point. Uh, Republican right. conservatives, all they have to do is, is speak to you know the their, their Tea Party base. Um, you know it'll help us win some Senate seats, but Latinos are very are concentrated in certain areas. Uh, but we may not be able to win in some Senate seats because there aren't that many Latinos. Or unless this becomes such a national issue um, on the progressive side that people really care about this strongly that aren't Latino or aren't immigrants. Now I'm remembering Lindsey Graham saying after. 
getting wiped out in, right. the, in the Latino vote in 2012. He said, unless we not just support but take the lead on immigration reform, there'll be a, the, it will be in a death spiral for right. the Republican Party and never be able to capture the White House, which may be... May be true. I yeah. hope. I hope it is true. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, it's you know, one of the things that we saw in Arizona is the way we were able to kind of change the narrative on on immigration immigration policy in Arizona is that when we started winning elections because we voted out uh, members of the state house and state senate <clears throat> that were anti Latino and were using harmful rhetoric, it actually changed mm. the rhetoric of the Republican Party in the state, and that changed a lot of the actual, you know, vociferous. Voices that were out there that were really, really harsh yeah. about uh, immigration and the border and issues like that. Right. Congressman Ruben Gallego with us from the 7th District of uh, Arizona. Uh, you think of Arizona, you think of Arizona as a red state. You think of Arizona as a state where there's probably very strong support for the NRA and for the... Uh, the most liberal, uh, uh, if not progressive, but right. <laughs> most widespread, if you will, interpretation of the Second Amendment. I know this is an important issue for you. I was looking at your website where uh, you really very strongly feel about closing the gun loopholes, for example. How does that play in your district and in Arizona in general? Well, it plays uh, very well in my district and it plays uh, very well in general because it's just a common sense issue. Um, if we aren't allowing you to fly, why would we give you a deadly weapon, especially weapons that are designed to harm uh, other people? Um, and it's not just guns. It's also bomb-making material, which you can also buy uh, in, in the open market. I think people forget that. Uh, but if you poll NRA members, it pulls through the roof. Uh, you know, I, I I serve in the Marines for many years. I talk to my you know Marine uh, you know friends that I serve with, and I tell them about this, and they're just it's, this doesn't pass the the common sense test. Uh, it, you know, I think it's going to grow and grow. Uh, we're going to have to keep pushing other members uh, of Congress for them to recognize that this is something that actually matters. But gun control does uh, is a very sensitive issue in Arizona, but also on uh, in terms of something that we desperately need. I mean, we saw uh, what happened uh, to Congresswoman Gabby Giffords. It really shocked um, Arizona. Um, and But just much like everywhere else uh, in this nation, uh, we heard these calls and si moments of silence, and then the Republican legislature of Arizona just continued to open up mm -hmm. and, and create more ways for people to get weapons instead of trying to find logical and gun do control. Do you find voters motivated to vote on this issue? I mean, that seems to be the problem that... People will have these moments of silence, but it, it seems to be the problem for advocates who want to, to get something done that the bottom line is the pro-Second Amendment people are much more motivated to vote. Yeah, I think you. The what I've seen is for those that can make it an issue, have mm -hmm. the funds to do it, they, they can win on this issue and they can actually, uh, you know, effectively uh, have a pro-gun uh, control message. Uh, and you actually see that across uh, the country. There was, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, there was a Democratic member of Congress that was taken out in a primary mm. because he wasn't sufficiently mm -hmm. uh, pro-gun control. So it does occur, but you have to have the funds to get your message out. And many times um, it's the NRA that actually has the money for the messaging mm. in some of these districts. But what I've seen, whenever you talked about it, I talked a lot about it during my primary, it, d it can make a difference. But you have to be able to get your message out, much like, much like anything else. If I recall correctly, even your senior senator supports closing the loophole for, uh, I'm, I don't know about the no-fly, I would guess that he supports that, but for gun shows and online sales. That's well, he doesn't support the, the closing the loophole for uh, the no-fly list. Uh, really? Yeah. Um, again, I, I he's got a primary, not, right? He's got, he's got a primary, and yeah, again, he's got a primary, uh, and he's worried about winning that primary. Okay. Uh Yeah. Someone to the to the right of McCain, yeah. um, and in the past he has been for um, uh, different types of background checks. But you know, to be honest, McCain has been all over the issue on all over all the issues. I mean, yeah. it's, uh, yeah. um, he's huh. been pro immigration reform, anti immigration reform, pro immigration reform. Well, that just depends, depends on who the president is. But right? it also depends who who's primarying him. Oh. Um, you know, a couple of years ago he he was on a you know uh, in a commercial saying build a dang wall, and then you know. Two months later, he was trying to pass conference immigration reform, and then two, year, two years after that, he hasn't done anything for it. So he's all over the place. Is that a state that – is there a, a Democratic candidate that would be, I don't know, make that a competitive state at all? Well, I'm absolutely. Well, I mean, you have Richard Carmona in 2012 that came within three points. Mm -hmm. uh, 
of Senator Flake, and that was a very, very hard year in Arizona. Mitt Romney was running the top of the mm-hmm. ticket. Um, Jeff Flake, uh, who a, a is still yeah. a very popular uh, member of the Senate, and at that point a member of Congress, ran, and Carmona came within three points in a race that was fairly underfunded. So we, you can. Um, you know, Anchor Patrick is the type of person that has that kind of personality. She's you know, a, a true uh, Western uh, woman from you know, born and raised in Arizona, speaks fluent Navajo. <laughs> I don't even know how that's happened. Wow. Uh, and yeah. you know, she's just a, a great member of Congress, and I think she, she's going to really uh, make this a competitive seat. Will there be a vote? Um, we don't, I know we have very few days left mm. before the Christmas break. Will there be a vote in the next few days on the no-fly There's been several votes, attempts at votes already, and we've been blocked repeatedly by the Republican Party uh, from even bringing bringing this up to a debate. Last night, we uh, they they ruled some of our amendments were not germane, um, which is you know ridiculous because you know this this Republican caucus will find almost anything to be germane. Uh, But uh, you know, a a couple days after you know uh, a mass shooting, uh, they can't find a way to bring the you know this really important bill down. uh, well, you know, they they certainly moved right. uh, like grease lightning uh, when dealing with Syrian refugees, even though there was no data, nothing to prove that Syrian refugees were at all involved in the Paris attack. Uh, but uh, when it comes to this, because they're responding to the NRA lackeys, you know, they're not going to move that fast. Right. If at all. Right. Congressman Ruben Gallego here from uh, the 7th District of Arizona. And Eliski from the Boston Globe. Uh, what kind of t- uh, support is Donald Trump getting in Arizona, Congressman? I mean, he's still polling in first place. Um, you know, the, it's primary voters make up these elections, and uh, you know, he's speaking to that base with his with his rhetoric, whether it's against Latinos or now against our Muslim community. Yeah, uh, and speaking of the reaction to of his comments about the Muslim community and the reaction of too many American, well, a lot too many Americans who support him, as far as I'm concerned, what is the feeling in Congress about? Um, this fight against ISIS, which the president talked about mm-hmm. like last Sunday. Let's start with the uh, authorization for the use of military force. I mean, the president was saying, if we really are going to be serious about taking on right. ISIS, I ask you over a year ago right. for authority to go after them militarily. Well, and I think he's right, actually, on that. And, and you know, I, I, I have certain, um, you know, fears about uh, going down that road, but I think... Uh, it's very dangerous for us to be allowing uh, this type of conflict going on using old uh, authorizations and old justifications that are so widely interpreted that maybe the next president can use that to, to further involve us uh, deeper, deeper into the Middle East than we want to, specifically with ground troops. And many of us in Congress, including some of us that are veterans, have said, you know, we're here, we're willing to work with an AUMF, provided there's limitations on time and there's also limitations on use of ground troops versus the Republicans who say that they want right. no restrictions. And, you know, we, the last thing we want is another opportunity for us to get into that quagmire of the Middle East. Mm. And the last, the, the thing that ISIS wants the most is to make this a fight between ISIS and the United States yep. instead of the civilized world with, um, you know, our, our allies both in uh, Europe as well as uh, our Arab allies in the Middle East um, and Arab and non-Arab allies in the Middle East fighting against these uncivilized uh, people. Uh, and, you know, that's the biggest problem about Trump. He's making this a uh, an us versus them, and this is not what we want to do. We don't want to be fighting uh, Islam. We don't want to be fighting Muslims around the world. Um, that's what ISIS wants to do, and, and we're just, we shouldn't give them that opportunity. As Lindsey yeah. Graham has pointed out, you know, he's playing right into their hands. But back to the AUMF, what gets me, I mean, on the one hand, but the Republicans say, and I'm sure you've dealt with this, frust- been frustrated by this, they say this president is abusing his executive authority and going too far, signing all these executive orders on immigration, for example, boom, boom, boom. But we don't care if he just totally unilaterally conducts a war in the Middle East. You know, we are willing to let him do that without ever stepping up ourselves. And they won't even debate the AUMF. No, because within the within their own caucus, there is no consensus and uh, about uh, you know what exactly should be done. They just know that what they should do is attack the president. Do you think it's needed though? I mean, do you think that the authority does exist? For I, the- I think the, the authority exists, but I think it's also important um, for Congress to weigh in. Mm-hmm. And I think also it's, it's your job, right? It's our job. It's our and, and I'm on the House Armed Services Committee, so we have oversight over this. Uh, but the other thing is if 
again, we don't know who the next president is, uh, so we don't know what their intentions are going to be when it comes to this conflict. Mm. And having a UMF that we could appoint to that strictly uh, right. limits what they're able to do and the time frame, uh, one, makes them come back to Congress so we mm. so they could explain what their goals are and justification right. uh, is. Um, and two, you know, it, it stops this what is an unfortunate history of Congress giving away more and more power to the executive? Right. I mean, it, it doesn't have to be the AUMF that the president sent you, right? This is your chance to absolutely. Yeah, we could imagine it. it yep. It's exactly the way you want, and with the proper proper limitations on executive authority. Absolutely, but you just cannot get the Republicans to bring it up because they have no consensus. But again, all they know is how to you know attack the president instead of being part of constructive. Do you think the president has done a good job? I mean, there's a on this issue, I and mean, the Republicans have hammered him over and over again for the, you know, saying that ISIS was a JV team. Or, right. I mean, well, has he left a little bit of a vacuum there by um, misspeaking well, or? Well, I mean, I wouldn't worry about misspeaking. You know, just you know, from my experience, you know, dealing with in that area, uh, you know, it's it's actions that matter, not not words. Um, I think not taking ISIS as serious mm -hmm. as he did, as he should have in the beginning. Um, uh, and he's admit that, and his, his staff yeah. has admitted that. That that was the, the bigger mistake. Also, I think a lot of us just did not recognize how weak the Iraqi government was and the Iraqi army was. I mean, right. I used to patrol with Iraqi soldiers in Al-Ambar, and the Iraqi soldiers I saw and fought with were very brave men. Um, I never would imagine that was the Iraqi army that would flee uh, when, mm. uh, when ISIS would co was coming through. Now, to their credit, they're turning around. They've already yeah. taken about 60% of Ramadi. Um, they're taking back towns, but, you know, it's unfortunate that this happened, but you know, a lot of it is because of internal corruption in the Iraqi government. Congressman, it's good to have you here today. Thank you. It's great to have you in the United States Congress. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, first of uh, many years uh, in the Congress serving uh, the people of Arizona and the people of the United States. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great thank to you. see you. That's all for americasdemocrats.org. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. Maria Cristina Garcia, Danielle Allen, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook. For AmericasDemocrats.org, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us, support the show, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate.